Did you know there is a doctor on YouTube who promotes vitamin toxicity, E. coli infection, and cardiovascular disease? And by doctor, I mean chiropractor, which maybe is not too surprising given the state of chiropractic medicine. His name is Dr. Eric Berg, and he is not some tiny channel. He's a huge channel, 12 million subscribers, many millions of views every month. I've watched dozens of Dr. Berg videos, which admittedly is just a small portion of the 6,000 plus videos on his channel, but is more than enough to show just how unhinged he is. Science and evidence-based medicine, this channel is the antithesis of that. It is the epitome of pseudoscience and fear-mongering. So we're going to start with vitamin D because this is the thing I saw mentioned in really almost every single video I watched from him. Dr. Berg thinks many people are deficient in vitamin D and that this causes a whole host of issues, autoimmune disorders, weight gain, thoughts of impending doom. And the last one is the sensation of impending doom, like something bad is going to happen. This is another example of a mental problem that's coming from a physical nutrient deficiency. And this one is vitamin D3. I would recommend 20,000 I use of vitamin D3 daily for a few months. To be clear, 20,000 international units is a lot. It's about 33 times the RDA for an adult. But according to Dr. Berg, the RDA is wrong. Everyone, not just those with impending doom sensations, <laughs> needs way more vitamin D. What I would recommend for the average person is to take at least at least 10,000 IUs every single day. And on top of that, get some sun if you can. Why? Why 10,000? Why do we need so much more than the RDA? Why is the RDA so wrong? Well, according to Berg, 10,000 international units is how much we have circulating in our blood. 8,000 to 9,000 IUs. That's what's normal in your blood. So how are we going to get this if we're only recommending this or that. That's what I just don't understand. It doesn't make sense to me. It makes perfect sense to me. We don't use all of the vitamin D circulating in our blood every day, so we don't need to get that much every day. It's pretty simple, actually. In fact, serum vitamin D, the vitamin D in your blood, has a pretty long biological half-life. It's about 15 days, at least 15 days. Our bodies also store vitamin D in our fat, where it has a half-life of about two months, again, maybe more. It's theorized this is why our vitamin D levels don't fall as dramatically as we would expect them to after the winter months when we're getting significantly less sun. Our adipose tissue is releasing vitamin D into our blood during that time. In other words, 10,000 international units of vitamin D every single day is way too much simply because we don't use that much vitamin D every day. And if Dr. Berg really wants to know why experts recommend such small amounts, the 400 to 800 international units per day, all he has to do is read. The National Academy of Medicine, formerly the Institute of Medicine here in the U.S., this is the nonprofit that develops the RDA, and they have entire books dedicated to explaining in detail their reasoning, their recommendations. For vitamin D, just check out Dietary Reference Intakes for Calcium and Vitamin D. It is free for anyone to read. It is long, yes, it is hundreds of pages, but I would think anyone recommending high dose supplements way in excess of the RDA would want to read from the experts, maybe? Not understanding why so many recommend 600 international units a day for adults, believing that we need all of the vitamin D circulating that we need to replenish it every day. It's embarrassing, frankly. It's so bad that if this were the only video I ever saw from Dr. Berg, it alone would be enough for me personally to write him off as an unreliable source for nutrition information. Not just unreliable, but dangerous. Because not only is 10,000 international units way above the RDA, it's also way above the tolerable upper intake level of 4,000 international units. That's the most you want to consume on a daily basis. Beyond that, you are at greater risk for vitamin D toxicity and hypercalcemia, which is excess calcium in the blood, which can cause osteoporosis, kidney stones, and even kidney failure. And even 4,000 may be too high for some people. In this meta-analysis of RCT, 
expertise, the authors found a small increase in vitamin D-induced hypercalcemia among those consuming just 3,200 to 4,000 international units a day. And this was about four cases of hypercalcemia per 1,000. Our data indicate that similar to phase four drug studies, large numbers of individuals need to be studied to capture occasional or even rare adverse events. There is an urgent need for a rigorous reporting of safety-related outcomes in vitamin D supplementation or fortification trials, at least if moderately high vitamin D doses are used. So the maximum dose we should take for safety is still uncertain, but what's clear is that some people are getting sick on doses way lower than what Dr. Berg recommends to everyone. At least, at least 10,000 IUs every single day. And for what exactly? Dr. Berg will tell you again that vitamin D helps with all sorts of things. He's absolutely certain that supplementing with vitamin D, high doses of it is crucial for health. But the science, the science is not so clear. From cancer to mortality, studies come to different conclusions, usually finding no association. And even when an association is found, like with mortality, participants are very rarely getting anywhere close to 10,000 international units per day. Now, just to be clear, there are credible experts who kind of agree with Berg. They do think we need more vitamin D. The well-respected Endocrine Society says we should aim for vitamin D levels of 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. This is the same range that Berg says in that video is optimal. Although to be clear, the Endocrine Society does not recommend 10,000 international units per day to reach these levels. In fact, they say follow the RDA. But 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter is much higher than the 20 that the Institute of Medicine deems acceptable. And there are many people on the other side who think we actually need less. In fact, many on the original Institute of Medicine committee who developed the RDA think actual deficiency is lower than 20. It should be 12.5 nanograms per milliliter. And it seems results from the huge vital study support this. Several analyses found no benefit to vitamin D supplementation, including for those with levels below 20. Vitamin D supplementation did not prevent cancer or cardiovascular disease, prevent falls, improve cognitive function, reduce atrial fibrillation, change body composition, reduce migraine frequency, improve stroke outcomes, decrease age-related macular degeneration, or reduce knee pain. There is no justification for measuring vitamin D in the general population or treating to a target serum level. Now, going back to Berg's video, several people did question his reasoning in the comments about the whole this is how much we have in our blood, this is how much we should take. And to his credit, he did admit he was wrong, but instead of then changing his recommendation, he just moved the goalposts. We need 10,000 international units of vitamin D every day, not because that's how much we actually use, but because some people have absorption issues. If you are overweight, a higher amount of vitamin D will be absorbed and stored in the fat cells. If the liver is fatty, then you will get less conversion into the active form. If the kidney is damaged, you will also not get the conversion. So there are so many ways to block absorption. So everyone should take super high doses of vitamin D because some people struggle to absorb vitamin D and maybe need higher doses. That's not how medicine works. He says a similar thing in this very recent video, Seven Stupid Health Mistakes. There is so much valuable information about vitamin D that's buried deep into the literature. And if you just do a superficial look at, you know, the first three pages on Google, you're probably going to find all sorts of uh, bias information and, oh yeah, vitamin D doesn't do anything and we get enough from our diet or the sun. And that is just terrible information because so many people have vitamin D resistance. Vitamin D resistance. I had to look that up. What is that? Well, there is something called hereditary vitamin D resistant rickets or HVDRR, but this is a rare genetic disorder. It's not something so many people have. I think what he's referring to is acquired vitamin D resistance. This is something that's popped up kind of recently. If you Google it, almost every single link points to this 2021 paper in which the authors argue that this supposed resistance to vitamin D might cause autoimmune disorders. It's a hypothesis. It is not an established medical fact or condition. This is not something that a doctor is going to diagnose you with. We don't know if acquired vitamin D resistance really exists. And yet to Dr. Berg, so many people have it. So many people have vitamin D 
resistance. Many, if not most, promising medical hypotheses turn out to be wrong. This is why they are rigorously studied. One paper arguing for this acquired vitamin D resistance, based mostly on clinical experience, by the way, is not rigorous. Now, Dr. Berg is right that there are conditions that inhibit the body's ability to absorb vitamin D, obesity, for instance. People with these conditions may benefit from higher doses of vitamin D, but number one, you are supposed to confirm your levels are actually low and work with a doctor before just like taking high dose supplements on your own. And number two, again, Berg wants everyone, every single person to take high doses of vitamin D. His views on vitamin D alone are really enough, I think, to show just how little he values expert opinion, expert analysis, how little he cares about the science. It's hard not to assume that maybe there are other reasons he's so keen on recommending so much supplementation. I, you know, maybe I'm crazy, but yeah. As if encouraging millions of people to consume potentially toxic levels of vitamin D wasn't bad enough, Dr. Berg also encourages dry fasting, no food, no water. Now, to be fair, he's not saying don't drink any water for 24 hours plus. 12 hours of dry fasting for 30 days. It's basically Ramadan, right? No food or water from dusk to dawn for 30 days. There is a lot of research into that area that shows a lot of health benefits. Is there? He links four studies in the description, which, I mean, thanks for that. To be clear, he usually does not do that. There are usually no links to anything in the description. I mean, other than his books. One study is a preliminary study on 11 men with no control, meaning there's no non-fasting group for comparison. Another study is on 14 subjects with metabolic syndrome. Again, no control. This one actually compared dry fasting to regular fasting, kind of. There's two intervention groups, no control. So all 18 overweight women were put on dry fasting, wet fasting, which is regular fasting with water, right? And intermittent fasting for three days each, so nine days total. The only difference was one group did wet fasting first, the other group did dry fasting first. Finally, we have this one, 117 participants, but still no control. It's two intervention groups, again, one dry fasting for only two days a week, the other not. And both groups were dieting as well. They were both required to follow the Malaysian healthy plate. To be clear, this is not a lot of research on dry fasting, not at all. And as far as the title goes, that it's like three times more effective for fat loss. I think it can produce massive results, even if you do it in a smaller scale. Why? Because one day of dry fasting is equal to three days of water fasting. I have no idea where he gets this from. And this article on his own website, presumably written by himself, doesn't agree. There is no data showing that a dry fast is better. I'm telling you, a lot of people have never got their body into a state where they're actually making water. All of our bodies make water though. They, they do make a small amount of water. To be charitable, maybe he's talking about making more water through dry fasting. I, I really don't know. And I don't think he knows either. I think he just says things. <laughs> Having watched so many of his videos, I think he just likes to hear himself talk. Hypercalcemia, dehydration in the name of fat loss, raw milk, why not? There's been some research done to show that children that consume raw milk versus pasteurized milk have lower incidence of asthma, allergies, decreased incidence of ear infections, and eczema, and even less respiratory infection. He doesn't list any source for this, which is very cool. Again, not surprising. From my own research, this whole thing with raw milk and allergies, it's really complex and it's not very well understood. Some studies do find an inverse correlation between unpasteurized raw milk consumption and risk for developing allergies or asthma, but not all. And in the vast majority of these studies, the kids who drink unpasteurized milk live on traditional farms, whereas the kids who drink pasteurized milk don't. This farm effect, as it's called, this association between living on a 
like traditional farm, not industrialized farm, and lower incidence of allergies is well established. It's been shown in many different studies, in many different communities, but it is still a correlation, right? It's not causation. We cannot say that living on a non-industrialized farm prevents allergies. And even if it does, we can't say that it's because of the raw milk. There are so many differences between traditional farm and urban living, or even traditional farm and rural living, that could contribute to allergy prevention. It could also be genetic too, right? Maybe the people who typically live on a traditional farm don't have allergies, are less prone to allergies. And because allergies are at least partially genetic, their children are going to be less prone to allergies as well. I don't know, man, if you've got like serious hay fever or asthma, you probably don't want to be living on a farm. Finally, looking solely at the studies that like really hype up this raw milk farm effect connection, the authors almost always recommend caution. Like this recent meta-analysis, they say the effect of farm milk consumption is independent of other farm exposures, aka they are convinced that the farm effect, this reduction in allergies, is due to the raw milk. And yet, consumption of raw milk and products thereof is strongly discouraged. Why? Because raw milk is full of bacteria. It is dangerous, especially for children. The vast majority of hospitalizations and deaths from drinking unpasteurized milk or eating unpasteurized dairy happen in children. So in summary, do I think raw milk is safe? Absolutely. If it is purchased from a farm that is clean. Tell that to Amy Nordic, whose 18-month-old son Seamus ended up severely sick after drinking raw milk from a top-notch exemplary farm. I do not believe anything wrong or negligent happened in the processing of our milk. I know our farm was impeccable, no bad practices. I've come to realize, though, that I was relying on everything happening perfectly twice a day, 365 days a year, including things outside the farmer's control. And that caught up to me. Raw milk is great until it is contaminated. Luckily, Seamus recovered, but not all do. Some die, many end up with lifelong complications. You wouldn't feed your child raw chicken. There's nothing that, no matter how natural or how healthy you want to be, that raw chicken is a good idea. Raw milk is the same way. You can get away with eating raw meat to a certain extent. Eventually, you're going to get something. It's just a matter of time. Same thing with raw milk. You can get away with drinking it for a while, eventually it's going to get you. You can't clean everything. That was the downfall of the sailors. They cleaned everything. They bleached everything out. They were very, very clean. But it was a hair, ultimately, that fell in the milk when the cows were being milked and that caused all of this. You can't prevent that. There's no possible way to prevent that. So yes, you can find studies pointing to a lower risk for allergies and asthma for children consuming raw milk. But what we know for a fact, not correlation, but for a fact, is that drinking raw milk, no matter how clean the farm, puts people at greater risk for severe health complications and even death. Now, I can't talk about Dr. Eric Berg without talking about keto, the keto diet. In fact, if you were already familiar with Dr. Berg before watching this video, this is probably why. He's the number one keto authority, apparently. He has an infinite number of videos on keto. Almost any time he's talking about a specific health ailment, he is recommending a ketogenic diet for that ailment, along with vitamin D and dry fasting, of course. Can keto reverse kidney disease? He doesn't actually answer this question. He does heavily imply, right, that if you're like stage one to four, not stage five, but stage one to four, that you can reverse it by eating a very low carb, aka keto diet. He bases this on one study in mice, which he actually admits in the video, he admits it's a, it's a mice study, but seemingly has no qualms with that whatsoever. <laughs> no explanation why that might be problematic. We shouldn't base dietary guidelines on one human trial, let alone a non-human trial. It's just embarrassing, and it suggests that he is recommending a diet, in this case keto, and then hyping up anything that makes keto look good, no matter how small or irrelevant. He's starting from keto is good and then looking for anything to support keto being good. Because of course, right? He's the keto guy. He's the number one keto authority. <laughs> I don't know why that's so funny to me. And because he's the number one keto authority, he thinks 
Cholesterol levels don't matter. Saturated fat is good for us. Red meat is good for us. We've been eating red meat for a very long time. It still retains all the vitamins, the minerals, the other stuff that's in there that can help you. And yes, there is different levels of processed meat, but to lump in the red meat with the processed meat and even you know state that they are both the same as far as causing cancer is stupid because red meat is one of the most healing things that you can consume, especially for gut health. First, processed meat is group one carcinogenic and red meat is group 2A, which is probably carcinogenic. They they are put in separate groups. No one thinks they present the same risks. So I, I don't know what he's talking about here. Second, it's stupid because red meat is healing is dare I say, a stupid response, especially with no sources whatsoever. It's way stupider than saying red meat and processed meat present the same risk because while the evidence for a link between red meat and cancer, etc., is not as strong as the link between processed meat and disease, it is still there. It is still present and consistent across studies. Studies consistently find a positive correlation between red meat consumption around 100 grams per day or above 100 grams per day and certain diseases, particularly cancer and CVD. And substitution analyses consistently find lower risk when red meat is replaced with virtually anything else, low-fat dairy, chicken, fish, plants. You know what isn't consistent across studies? this healing effect of red meat. And the fact he links no supporting evidence for this healing effect tells me everything I need to know. As far as cholesterol and saturated fat are concerned, yeah, he's wrong. Cholesterol levels very much matter, particularly LDL and ApoB. Lower LDL and ApoB mean a lower risk for atherosclerosis and heart disease. And how do we lower these numbers? Weight loss is good if you're overweight. Fiber is good. Exercise is pretty good but also replacing saturated fat with unsaturated fat. If you're looking for a really simple explanation of this, of heart disease risk, I really love this video. It was just published by Nutrition Made Simple. It's a really simple explanation, a really great little visual. I love it, highly recommend. If you want a more detailed, a much more detailed look at this at cholesterol, and blood lipid panels and diet and cholesterol levels, I highly recommend these two articles at sigmanutrition.com. Suffice it to say, consensus on cholesterol, on saturated fat is very clear. One, blood lipid levels matter. Two, saturated fat at best is neutral. And three, unsaturated fat is healthy and should be emphasized over saturated fat. Saturated fat should be replaced with unsaturated fat. If someone is saying otherwise, if they are saying saturated fat is good for us, actually, it's necessary for health, they are going against consensus, a consensus built on decades of research. It is one of the most studied things in nutrition, saturated fat and cholesterol. You need a bit more than a whiteboard and an authoritative voice. Like seriously, all these supposed reasons why saturated fat is so healthy and yet no sources except this random critique of the Eat Lancet report that has no nothing to do with anything he's talking about. It's crazy. Point is we should care about saturated fat and we should be very wary of any diet that encourages saturated fat consumption, which means keto. Unless you're doing like a low coconut vegan keto, you are going to consume a lot of saturated fat on a keto diet, on Eric Berg's healthy keto plan, whatever he calls it. I would not recommend getting your protein from a plant source. I would recommend getting it from animal protein. That is the best protein that you can consume. And out of all the proteins you can consume, Red meat is at the top of the list. And even if you are doing a low coconut, a low saturated fat vegan keto plan, you should still be wary. We really don't know the long-term consequences of cutting carbs down so low. Having watched 70, I don't even know, so many of Dr. Berg's videos, I get the sense that he is a very conspiratorially minded individual. Conspirator conspiratorially? That's not right conspiratorially minded. I'm too tired. <laughs> Anything health related that disagrees with him that doesn't align with his like keto raw milk dry fasting narrative is chalked up as like some conspiracy. P people just want to keep 
people sick, right? So doctors, of course, he's very suspicious of doctors. You go to the doctor and they might ask you about what you're taking and you say, I'm taking these vitamins, I'm taking magnesium, et cetera. And they're going to just kind of go, oh, you don't need that. You can get that from your diet. And then you accept it as a fact. Unfortunately, just because someone has an MD behind their name or even a PhD behind their name doesn't mean they fully evaluated all the information. They haven't even looked at it. They just tell you their opinion and then you accept it. So that would be a big mistake. Shocking, the guy who sells 50,000 different supplements doesn't like when actual doctors discourage their use. But I think my favorite example of his mindset comes from this is Dr. Eric Berg, a Scientologist at DrEricBergScientology.com. When asked why Scientology is so disliked, Dr. Berg says it's always been this way. You have every governmental agency on the planet trying to wipe out Scientology. Why? Because it helps people. Oh yeah, by the way, Dr. Burke is a Scientologist. This came out uh, three or so years ago now when his son, Ian Rafalco, put out this TikTok announcing it to the world. Not only is this man a Scientologist, but he donates copious amounts. His profit margins are insane. They're through the roof. So he's donated probably around seven plus million dollars to Scientology. And every product of his that you buy, you donate to Scientology as well, because he has a separate savings account just for that. Now, who cares? You, you might be saying to yourself, who cares what religion Dr. Berg or anyone else follows? What does this have to do with his channel? It's not like he's recommending Scientology on his channel. True. However, when someone who claims to be an expert on human nutrition, on the human body, claims that they helped create the human body. He once told me that he he was one of the beings who designed bodies. And believes anyone who criticizes his excessive supplement line is a suppressive person, aka antisocial. The suppressive person, Roger Mark Duploy. Uh, he's kind of uh, bashing my things. I just want to make sure if you look on our site, that he's blocked and banned from Facebook and the closed group. What you want to do periodically is kind of do searches for Eric Berg and scan social media to find these SPs and then cancel them out or block them. That's pretty scary, right? Scientologist or not, it's scary. And for me personally, like even, even if I liked his advice, even if it were evidence-based, I really would not feel comfortable supporting someone who is so delusional and egotistical and childish. There's so much more nonsense I could talk about here. It's like, it's overwhelming. Now, if you're doing intermittent fasting, okay, you'll need less. The requirements go down because you're recycling and you're, you're becoming more efficient with your minerals and other nutrients. What? Seed oils can cause a problem with insulin to the point where you gain a lot of weight. What? I remember last uh, winter, boy, I had some low back pain and then I, I, I remembered about vitamin D and I started taking vitamin D and it was completely gone within probably two hours. What? And yes, he thinks there are different hormonal body types that point to different diets. Just kidding. They all point to keto. That was one of the funniest things when I saw the diet type thing. I was like, wait, but he recommends keto for like everyone. So how does that work? Oh no, he's, he still just recommends keto. <laughs> I think he started doing the hormonal diet type thing first. I'm pretty sure that was like years and years ago he started recommending that because he has some really old videos on it way before the keto stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if anyone has any, any information I would love to have it. Maybe he has an old book or something, but I would love to know if he did used to recommend like different diets per, for people based on their adrenal body or ovary body or whatever. But now that keto is the profitable thing, right? He's got to, he's got to recommend keto to everyone. Maybe that's like extra cynical of me. I don't know. He is the best example of a complete scam artist um, that he cashes in on misinformation uh, through selling stuff through his website, for example. He has this whole anti-conventional medicine rhetoric, which is very popular in, in a lot of places now, and that kind of conspiratorial belief. Um, this whole food is medicine rhetoric, which we've discussed on the podcast before. Um, the fact that he claims that he prevents cancer with these fasting protocols in of itself. Um, and then the kind of clear quackish move to call yourself Dr. Berg, where you're 
you're a non-practicing chiropractor, but yet your YouTube channel is about nutrition and medicine. Uh, it's it's kind of quite misleading, I think, to use that, but it's a classic quack tactic. One of the most prolific and popular nutrition slash medical experts on the internet is a quack. If, if that's not upsetting to you, I don't know, man. Maybe you're just not easily upset, which like, I'm jealous. And he's financially incentivized to be a quack because what makes more money, right? Parroting the boring stuff people already know, right? Eat fruits and vegetables or jumping on trends, telling people you know better than their doctor. And actually they don't even need to see their doctor, just eat keto. Here's my $30 keto plan and take some vitamin D and hey, I sell that too. Adrenal fatigue is real, here's a supplement. Liver cleansing, that's legit, here's a supplement. Hey, immune support, who doesn't wanna support their immune system, especially after a global pandemic? The comments on his videos make it clear that he is fostering a community of conspiracy theorists, right? They, they think that doctors are lying to them, that they are intentionally keeping them sick, that they know keto is best, but they're keeping it from them. <laughs> what happens when people like this actually get sick? Go to the doctor? Why would they do that? They don't trust doctors. And anyway, they've got Dr. Berg. Just pop a few nerve support or veggie solution pills. It's fine. Now, to end on a positive note, luckily there are really good nutrition and medical sources out there that are free of like quackery incentive. I already mentioned Nutrition Made Simple. It's a channel here on YouTube. Sigma Nutrition is another one, sigmanutrition.com, examine.com. None of these take any sponsorships. None of them peddle any supplements whatsoever. And if you're looking for vegan specific information, nutrition information, I highly recommend veganhealth.org and thevegandrd.com. Speaking of vegan, obviously this is a vegan channel given the name of the channel, but I do like to branch out and talk about topics like these and like nutrition pseudoscience in general. And you'll see from my sources, none of them have anything to do with veganism except for the two explicit vegan nutrition sites I just mentioned. None of the stuff on saturated fat or vitamin D or anything else that I link to in the description have anything to do with veganism. They're not from like vegan websites or anything. I love veganism for the animals. I love it for the environment. I do believe it's a really healthy way to eat, but I don't believe that you have to be vegan, that you have to avoid animal products entirely to be healthy. I think it's pretty clear that some fish is pretty healthy. Unfortunately, I wish that weren't the way it was. I think fishing is really unethical. Point is, I definitely have a bias against animal products, and obviously Dr. Berg is very big on promoting animal products and keto and whatnot, but hopefully you can see that my arguments here against his channel are not coming from a vegan place. I think we can all come together on this, right? Vegan or carnivore. Well, maybe not carnivore, but omnivore. <laughs> I think we can all say that, like, Dr. Berg is not, it's not a good thing to have on YouTube. It is, it's a stain on the medical nutrition YouTube landscape. Thank you so much for watching everybody. I really hope you enjoyed this. I would love for you to like the video and subscribe. And of course, thank you so much to my members and my patrons at patreon.com slash unnatural vegan. I do actually post two exclusive videos for tier two members and patrons. I do just a vlog talking about my kids and whatever else. We went to the beach recently, Haystack Rock in Oregon. That was pretty fun on Cannon Beach. And then my second video is a controversial topic, something that's unrelated to veganism or health or anything else, something, you know, I wouldn't really want to put publicly on the channel. So that's just, again, for tier two members and patrons. I have the controversial for this month for July coming up very soon. And yeah, that's it for me. Thanks again, guys. New video soon. The Scientology thing was very interesting because I got to reading about the SP stuff because I knew like a little bit about suppressive person. And I just thought it meant that person's not a Scientologist anymore. So now you can't associate with them, right? Which is a fairly common thing with more extreme religions or cults or whatever. But it was interesting to read the Wikipedia page and to see that like what Eric Berg is doing just saying everyone is an SP, anyone who criticizes him is a suppressive person. Apparently that is not the way it was intended. L. Ron Hubbard 
did not agree with that. You see all these SP orders and so on. Don't throw it around carelessly because this is a very exaggerated condition, SP. He thought it was like a very tiny, tiny percentage, small percentage of uh, the population. He didn't want it to just be thrown around. So yeah, I don't know. That kind of seems like what Eric Berg is doing, which maybe is kind of like not very Scientological of him. <laughs> kind of anti-Scientology or at least anti L. Ron Hubbard, who was the creator, right? I don't know. I don't know how any of that show works. It's all crazy. His son is out of it, by the way. I mean, you probably, you probably uh, got that given he, you know, kind of outed his father. Yeah, he's no longer a Scientologist. So good for him. 